The first thing we want to learn about is the law of mass actions. So we are going to start using a simple equation. A, B plus B, X give you C, Y plus D, Z. The first question I want to ask you is actually, in these reactions, what are your reactants? V and X. What are your products? So what is your A, B, C, D? Typically, we call it stoichiometry coefficient. When you read a chemical equation, know what is your reactant, what is your product. Okay, so if you look at this plot. Okay, so what is your x-axis? Time, okay. What is your y-axis? The concentration of the reactant and product. See the color coding here? This two. is your reactant, right? And the button two is your product. What this does is actually, if today you let this reaction to occur, you have your initial concentration of your reactant and product, right? If you have certain concentration of a reactant, okay, you don't have product in the beginning. Then you start to monitor the concentration of each species, how it actually evolve. And that's actually the typical plot you're going to see. How does the concentration of your reactant evolve? Does it increase or decrease? Decrease, right? Your reactant starts to decrease. The reason it decreases is because it's forming a product. So at the same time, you see your product start to show up. If these things goes on and on and on and on, okay, after a very, very long time, then what do you see? You reach equilibrium, right? So when you reach equilibrium, does the concentration of each species changing? Does it change over time? No, it becomes a constant, right? So once you see these things happen, which means actually the concentration of your reactant, concentration of your product, they don't change anymore. We call the system is reaching its equilibrium. We are going to define something called Q. Q is so-called the reaction quotient. And the way we define this reaction quotient, okay, is going to, we need to put some quantity of your product, okay, on the numerator, okay? Put some quantity of your reaction at the denominator, okay? And the way we put it is actually, we know Y and Z. Y and Z is your product, right? Okay. We use leg concentration raised to the C's power, D's power, which is actually its associate coefficient in front of it. Okay, divided by the same thing, okay, but you do it with your reactant. Now let's get back to these figures. I'm going to ask you one simple question, okay? Is chemical caution a constant? or the chemical quotient will change with time. Change with time, right? Because the concentration in the beginning is actually changing, right? Can you actually calculate the chemical quotient at this time point? You can do that, right? So you just need to find out the reactant concentration, product concentration, and plug back to the equation, right? Then you can get the chemical quotient. And then as time goes by, you can see Q1, Q2, Q3, they will be all different, right? Because the concentration of every species inside your reaction is actually changing. But after a certain time, which we know when the system reach equilibrium, the concentration of your species, they don't change anymore, right? That means your chemical quotient will be a constant. Under that condition, we call the chemical quotient is equal to your equilibrium constant. 
So equilibrium constant just a very specific cases that the chemical quotient reach equilibrium. That's why they have very they have actually exactly the same formula. From here we know the chemical quotient is going to equal to your equilibrium constant once your system reach equilibrium at a given temperature. So that's the difference between chemical quotient and the equilibrium constant. So you should remember it's actually a chemical quotient is a function of time, okay? Depending on how the reaction is actually progressed, okay? The Q can be any number. But once you reach equilibrium, your chemical quotient is going to equal to your equilibrium constant. For all reactions, what you should expect is that the system, the reaction eventually is going to reach equilibrium, right? Therefore, your reaction always happens in a way that you are going to make your Q equal to your K. So let me say again, okay? For a given reaction, eventually the reaction is going to reach equilibrium. Mathematically, what it means is actually the reaction is actually proceed in a way that you want to make your Q equal to your K. This is actually a very important concept because in your homework, you are going to get asked this type of questions a lot. The question you're going to encounter is like this. I give you a Q. I give you a K. Tell me where the reaction is going to move. The simplest case is actually if the Q is equal to K, then the reaction will, will not move, right? Because it's already at equilibrium. So it's not moving toward your reaction side. It's not moving toward the product side. It's at equilibrium already. However, if today, if I give you two numbers for your Q and K, and then when you compare them, you realize your Q is smaller than K, then you should be able to predict the direction will actually move toward the product side. So what does this mean? Okay, we want to actually have a better idea, right? Because when we write out a Q, it is always product over reactant, right? If Q is smaller than K, that means you don't have enough product compared to the equilibrium condition, right? So the system will actually push the reaction toward the product direction so you can actually crank up your denominator so that eventually you will equal, uh, equal, uh, equal to your K. If today you compare your Q and K and then you realize your Q is larger than the K. Okay, that means actually you have too much product, right? You want to bring the product back to your reactant. Okay, so the reaction is going to move toward the reactant side. It's very important that you know that, okay, when you compare your Q and K, then you can predict where the reaction is actually moving toward. Okay, so this is actually the first type of question you're going to encounter for chapter 12. Okay, then we need to actually move to the second one. Okay, so how do we actually get the Q or how do we get the K? How is this so-called the law of actions was generated? Okay, how do we know that it's actually true? So far, the things that you have learned in chapter 11 is all about the chemical kinetics, right? And then one of the very important concepts from the chemical kinetics is actually if today you have elementary steps, then you can actually write out the red law directly. So we're going to use this one as example. OK, so this is actually a reaction that the hydrogen is going to inter interact with your nitrogen to form the means, right? So N2 plus BH2 going to produce 2NH3. So when the system reach equilibrium, we're going to write this double arrow. So let's actually the symbol to represent the system has reached equilibrium. You can actually write these things uh, separately. So I can write, okay, this one is actually going to equivalent us N2 in the gas form plus H2 in the gas form. That's going to form your 
to an edge three, right? We call this as a forward reaction. But for your system to reach equilibrium, okay, that means actually you also have things happening in the reverse direction, right? So this is so-called the reversed reaction. When you write down these things, okay, assuming these are actually your elementary steps, then for your forward reactions, you can actually write out your rate. Okay, then you know the rate can be written as forward rate constant K times your N2 H P three H two, okay, and then H two to the third power. All right. So you can only do this when you have elementary steps. You can do the same thing for your the rate of reverse reaction. It's going to equal to your rate constant K reverse multiply. Right now your reactant is an H three. To the second power. When we say a system reach equilibrium, one very, very key concept you should have is that what it really means is actually the forward rate is going to equal to your reverse rate. So that the concentration of all the species on both sides, they can remain a constant. So at equilibrium, what we know is actually the forward rate is going to equal to your reverse rate. The definition of the equilibrium constant was defined as the rate constant forward over the rate constant reverse. Once you do this, okay, once you know that's the definition, you want to substitute your KR in the KF with this. All right, so what you're going to do is actually you can from here, you know, your KF is going to equals to your RF divided by your N2 to the first power, H2 to the third power. Here you do the same, you can get your KR is just equals to your, the rate of reverse reaction divided by your NH3 square. So once you get this, once you get that, then we're going to plug in into here. Okay, so when you plug in into here, what you're going to get is the rate of the forward reaction divided by your N2, H2 to the third power, reverse rate divided by an H3 to the second power. And then this is going to give you reverse rate times your M2 H2 third power. On the top will be forward rate times an H3 to the second power. So once you have this, we know once you reach equilibrium, right? Your RF and your RR, they are actually the same, so they will cancel out. So once you do that, then you know your KEQ is simply equals to an H3 square, M2 first power, H2 third power. And then if you look at that, this, it's actually just like the things we say, right? So when we define your reaction quotient, okay, it's really the product raised to its coefficient divided by the reactant raised to its coefficient. It actually all comes from the concept we have from chapter 11. Okay, so this is how we actually connect the equilibrium with kinetics.